To love the cat is to be the cat. Okay, we are definitely, beyond a doubt, recording now. <laughs> That's good to know. Uh, welcome to the Pope on Film. I am, it's, sometimes you stretch out the welcome, so I tried to, I tried to honor you there, like an homage. Welcome to the Pope on Film. I am Bunny Williams, and with me as always is... The Reverend Steve Galindo founder and pope of the church of ed wood and all around damn nice guy yeah all <laughs> around all around nice guy um I, I i wanted to um mention a couple of things wanted to mention a couple of things number one um you know what i just want to get into this orgy the dead is a horrible movie <laughs> It, this was this yeah this is a tough episode but it's one of those movies where it's such a horrible movie that you really kind of have to watch it where i am falling on this is see i absolutely cannot stand in any version manos the hands of fate oh really because that's just the best uh that's the best mystery science theater they ever made. Oh, it just bores me to tears. And it, even the mystery science theater version, for me, does not help it at all. Orgy of the Dead, the only thing that pushes Orgy of the Dead a little bit ahead of Manos to Hands of Fate is you got a lot of tits. Yeah. Yeah. But even those aren't much to write home about. They weren't great tits, no. This is our twenty first this is our twenty first episode. This is our twenty first episode, yeah. Uh-huh. This is episode twenty one. Our podcast can drink now. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good. Yes it can. <laughs> our our eighteenth episode, our podcast became an adult and was able to stay up late and watch Saturday Night Live. And it's also it's also uh, at the age of consent. So, uh, one yeah. point when I was editing that episode, I gave it a quick hand job. Good. Well, you know, you won't get in trouble for that. No, that's good. Unless it told me it was nineteen. Yeah. <laughs> good point. That that hits home. Yeah, that hits home. Seriously, Tim Burton is making Dumbo, and this is the last straw. Uh, oh, oh, you were actually going to retaliate this time? I don't know. But Tim Burton, no, he's making he's making three movies. Number one, he's making Beetlejuice 2, which is just another example of how people become famous for something and then decide to stray away from that famous thing and try and be famous for things other than the one thing that made them famous. But eventually, a lot of those people realize that they kind of suck and go back in desperation uh -huh. for the one thing that made them famous. That's how we got like Rocky Seven yeah. or whatever that last Rocky was, which was kind of pointless. Cause Rocky, now he's like, oh, no, 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 no. I got to disagree. I really, really like that movie, Rocky yeah. Balboa. Rocky Balboa. It's a good movie, but it's like, wow, really? You're making another Rocky at this point in your life? Like, and also, we didn't need Rambo 3. I could have done without the like actual fight in Rocky Balboa. Yeah. Because, frankly, that was pointless and that was stupid. Yeah. And uh, Basic Instinct 2. Oh, God. 
Basic Instinct 2. That was uh, uh, hers, whatever her name is, Sharon, Sharon, Sharon Stone. Stone. Yeah. The one thing I am personally really hoping for for Beetlejuice 2, all-female cast. Yeah, because that's, that's the thing now for sequels from for movies from that time. Beetlejuice was 80s, yeah? Beetlejuice was 80s? Beetlejuice was 80s, yes. Beetlejuice doesn't feel 80s. Do, do Beetle- you do you have any problem with the all-female cast of Ghostbusters? Uh, no, because the majority of them come from Saturday Night Live, and I love I love all of the women yeah. that they chose. I... That. I think if there was a different cast, then I would have a problem with it. But, oh, no, that cast is just fucking wonderful. I kind of feel like, okay, see, I like the first Ghostbusters, fucking hated the second. I cannot stand the second one, okay? Absolutely hate the second one. So this franchise, right off the bat, is running a 50-50 for me, you know? Mm -hmm. Right off the bat, Bill Murray says no, then I'm like, just don't do it. I don't, I you know. If you can't have the original cast, then I'm not seeing a point. Except if you're going to do a female cast and you're going to do a separate story. Okay? I would love to see... I would love to see... Because in the first movie, Bill Murray was like, the franchise rights alone will make us rich. You know? Yeah. Well, they're, yeah. they're a franchise. You know? Mm-hmm. I would love to see what is I I don't know any of these women I don't know their names I just know the 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 fat one Kristen who was just Wig. Tammy, Kristen Wiig from Saturday Night Live, okay. Melissa McCarthy from a bunch of movies like Tammy, but she got her start on the Gilmore Girls, which my wife was obsessed with. So I like her because she was sooky on Gilmore Girls, and I stand by my my like of Gilmore Girls. Um. And uh, two women who are currently on Saturday Night Live. Yeah. I, I, I See, I just kind of picture, like, Alyssa McCarthy, okay, in her, like, living room, a bunch of screaming kids in the background, okay? And she has one of those work-at-home, click-internet links kind of jobs. Yeah. Okay? And as she's clicking through links, she sees a sign for open your own Ghostbusters franchise. <laughs> and she's like, fuck yeah. <laughs> That'd be good. It's better than this. Um, Kate McKinnon is uh, the third girl from Ghostbusters. She is the first ever openly gay um, cast member on Saturday Night Live. Yeah. There have been gay people on Saturday Night Live, but she was the first one to be openly gay. And then Leslie Jones, who is like a tall and loud, like 42 year old black woman. Yeah. And she's going to be wonderful in this. She's done a skit this season where she is a cast member of one of those ghost hunter TV shows. Yeah. And that really could stand to be like her audition tape. For the all female Ghostbusters, because it's just it, it's a wonderful little skit, yeah. And she is a, amazing, and I, I I'm really excited uh, to see the four of them together in a movie. I would be down with that. Yeah, you know, a lot of people are doing ghost busting kind of stuff just privately now, just going places and doing quote unquote paranormal investigations yeah oh i have met I've, three groups just in this fucking town man you know oh there seems to be a lot of electromagnetic energy here that could only mean a ghost and yeah. nothing else they got their little ep whatever pms meters or you know and they, they go into places supposedly haunted oh man um did you hear that they're bringing back X Files? Really? Uh huh. I liked X Files in the beginning because yeah. it was just it was something where I didn't have to pay attention. There wasn't some big massive plot. Every episode was just a different, fun, weird, bizarre story. But when they started getting into this massive conspiracy and stuff like that. That's when I kind of lost it. Oh, I know. I love that. I love that. I really ate it up. But 
I have I have ruined the return of X Files for myself. Why? Because I sat back because because I really loved X Files. I don't find it very rewatchable though. But yeah. The first run, I loved it. Uh, so I was like, okay, if we're gonna if we're gonna if we're gonna get the same characters back, how should that show go? And mm-hmm. I figured out a whole kind of plot line for myself, so that if it's not that, I'm gonna be disappointed, no matter what they do. <laughs> Yep. You know, because I kind of figure like Mulder at this point. Mulder just got out of rehab for <laughs> sex addiction. Yeah. No, I think he should be like a Mr. X kind of character at this point. He's He's been kicked out of the FBI years ago. And he does a lot more work with his gun. You know, yep. let him let him grow a bit of a beard, take his hair down a little. You know, grease him up, you know. And then Scully played it straight, so she's like the inside man. I gotcha. You know? Yeah. So they'll have like, like, they will not really act up against each other the way they usually do. They'll have more like little clandestine meetings. Hmm. So that's it. That's it. If that, if that's, if they're not going to do that, and, so just that. And they're not going to do that because they never listen to me. Yes. I- I'm going to be disappointed. <laughs> well, I'm sorry to disappoint you. Yeah. But, yeah, I'm pretty sure they're not going to be doing that. I'm pretty sure they're not going to be doing that, too, because it's genius. <laughs> I'm in the middle of... I'm eating chips, by the way. I'm eating chips during this podcast. Cool. Uh, you didn't finish telling us about Dumbo. Oh, goddamn Dumbo. Goddamn Dumbo. Seriously. Since I was in college, since I was in college, and that was a long time ago, I've been telling people my theory that Tim Burton is only making movies for me and for no one else. And everyone has, I have been laughed at. I have been scoffed at. (laughs) People have said, why, Mr. Galindo, you are crazy, sir. There is no way that this could be true. And then with every movie, I'm like, ah, 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 he's doing a Sweeney Todd. That's my favorite musical. Come on, this can't, this can't be a coincidence. And they, <laughs> I have been laughed at. Come on, Dark Shadows. I used to watch that when I was a kid. Really? Nobody? Nobody's, nobody's seeing this? <laughs> but he has two movies that are coming out. He's in post-production on the movie Miss Peregrine's or Peregrine's. Miss Peregrine's Home for Peculiar Children, Uh which is based on a teen book that I bought, but I never read. It's in my house. (laughs) It's on my bookshelf gathering dust. And I was like, oh, one of these days I'm going to read it. One of these days I'm going to read this book. I own this. One of these days I'm going to. And now Tim Burton's making a goddamn movie out of it because he heard that I was going to read it. That's how he found out. He's got spies. You should check and see if it's still there. (laughs) Oh, Jesus Christ. Like, like I find it and there's a there's a like a Tim Burton autograph in the cover. And now he left his DNA between pages. Yeah. And now comes news that he's making Dumbo. And this is the last straw. Now, now that like when that when when that announcement came through the pipeline that he was making a live action slash CGI version of Mm -hmm. Dumbo. Like I immediately went around and started texting people that I knew. And I'm like, see, 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 huh? And everyone said pretty much almost everybody said the same thing, which was, okay. well, now it's getting creepy. Well, it he really has to be stopped now because, see, the way I'm seeing it is uh, you're Bruce Lee and he's the dragon. OK, ah. OK, because now didn't you tell me that Dumbo is like Maxwell's favorite movie right around now? Yeah. Yeah. And when I was a, when I was a kid, because, you know, I, I lived in an all white neighborhood and a lot of the kids is parents wouldn't let me in their house to play Mm -hmm. so i had a lot of time by myself growing up so i would get the the tv guide and i would scour it looking for movies that i might want to own 
And then I would wait for it to come on and record it on VHS or beta when I was really super young. Yeah. And so I had this this beat up copy of Dumbo on Did you did you use it was on beta. Did you used to sit there with the remote control cutting out the commercials? Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> I yeah. Always do that. Yeah. That was me too. But I had I had a copy of Dumbo and since Dumbo was only like 60 minutes long, it came with a bunch of other cartoons before it. Um, it, Mickey and the Beanstalk and yeah. Lamp the Sheepish Lion were the two cartoons. And then it went into Dumbo and I would just watch it and rewatch it over and over again. There were a couple of movies that I owned that I recorded from TV. I, I remember I would always watch that and Airplane. Those were my two movies that I just loved watching over and over again yeah. that I recorded on TV. So it meant a lot to me when Maxwell saw it and just fell in love with it. And now... Tim Burton is making it, and this is the last straw. But see, that makes that makes Maxwell Brandon Lee. We oh my God, he's gonna. We can't have this. Yeah. You know what Maxwell's gotten into recently? Um, Teletubbies. Teletubbies, yeah. Teletubbies. Huh? It's just, uh, Teletubbies. It, so that might be that might be Tim Burton's next movie after Beetlejuice two. They they're gonna turn him gay, like a gritty Teletubbies, <laughs> like Johnny <laughs> Depp is. He's angry. Johnny Depp is Tinky Winky. Because <laughs> when Teletubbies was on TV, there was a lot of talk about how one of them had like a triangle shape on his head, so that must mean that Teletubbies supports gaiety. And there was a little bit of ass patting here and there, you know. But what I was more concerned about was the fact that one of the Teletubbies had a circle shape on his head, and one of the other ones had what looked like a dildo shape on his head. Yes. <laughs> That's what I'm more concerned about, because, like, oh, make sure they don't headbutt each other, because then they'll have baby Teletubbies all over Teletubby land. And that won't be good. Well, you know, grow up. Where do you think Teletubbies come from? Okay. Didn't your Marijuana parents, consumption? Didn't, you, didn't your parents have this talk with you? <laughs> oh, okay. I see what you're saying. They have I to, thought you were asking me where the actual show came from. And I said no. marijuana consumption is <laughs> what it seems to be. No, no. You know, they just have different sexual organs in there on top of their heads. It could happen. There could Seriously, be, there could when be I was some a kid, evolutionary advantage to that, you know. When I was a kid, I used to collect Mars Attacks trading cards. Yeah. So I would go to the comic book store, and then every time I would go to the comic book store, then he, he like, oh, hey, there's this new comic book store I want to go to. And then we'd go this long distance to get to a place that's 60% trading cards. And 40% comic books. And yeah. I'd be really disappointed. So I'd look around the comic, the trading cards and I, it, I would find these hyper violent trading cards and I would buy them. And my parents never paid attention to what I bought. So I bought these Mars attacks trading cards. So the, the simple fact that he made a movie of Ed Wood and then followed that up with Mars attacks, that says a lot right there. Mm -hmm. A lot. Uh huh. Oh my God! And Planet of the Apes. How horrible was that? <laughs> oh, that was bad. Is Planet of the Apes? That was, that was bad. bad. But I still wanted to give Zira a bit. I did. Huh? I I still wanted to bend Zira over. Helena Bonham Carter is hot, even if she's a monkey. Yeah, I like Helena Bonham Carter. Yeah. Sweeney's Todd was good. So I wanted to see some hot monkey sex. Hot monkey sex. That's a good phrase. <laughs> and a good band a good, name. That would be a good band name. I saw Sweeney Todd and I like I don't remember it. I remember I remember it being visually Tim Burton, you know? But yeah. like but like good, you know? I remember <laughs> it being visually very good and very Tim Burton. Um and I kinda liked seeing that look again. You know, 
Although yep. he's he's never exactly gotten away from it, you know. Yeah. No, um, he. Has. But other than that, I mean, I I already know the story of Sweeney Todd, but like I have no real recollection of that movie. <laughs> yeah. I like that. Yeah. Dark Shadows is horrible. Um, I liked his take on Alice in Wonderland. I really liked that. But I think I liked it because I saw it in 3D IMAX, you know, real expensive and nice seats and the whole shebang. I'm not sure if it's possible to hate a movie when I go see it in 3D IMAX and all of that sort of stuff. Yeah. And you can also kind of kind of like it more just the experience and then walk out and just be, this is a crap movie. Yeah. (laughs) You know? Yeah. Yeah. I there I can't I would, except for oh god we were just talking about it except for Jurassic Park uh-huh. I, I, there are a ton of other movies but I can't think of what the hell they are now where that I had that experience just like watching in the theater being like it's movie rules and then eventually like watching it on TV or on tape or something like that and being like what did I think was good about this <laughs> I felt that way about Independence Day. I thought Independence Day, when it came out, was just the greatest movie of all time, and now it's just the ah, oh, it's the fucking worst. It is so horrible. There's so much wrong with Independence Day. <laughs> I I like it for its characters, and I find it fun. I don't, you know, take it like a serious movie, you know. Yeah. But any movie where you defeat the enemy by firing a drunk at them, <laughs> I'm I'm down with it. <laughs> <laughs> you know and then they go spread that word we we know how to take the ships down and i could just picture people in india being like what do you mean we we have to get a drunk <laughs> <laughs> okay we, we'll go to bangkok <laughs> <laughs> plenty drunks there <laughs> So I didn't see I didn't see uh, Tim Burton's last movie, Big Eyes, because I have always been fascinated with those ugly paintings from the 70s. So then he made a movie about it. So then I was just, you know what? I'm not even touching this. Well, that that is just like personally one of my favorite jokes whenever I start talking about like art and, you know, bringing out true meaning and trying to get at something artistic, artistically valid, you know, that people can see your soul when they look at it like those paintings with the kids with the really big eyes yeah yeah i heard that it's supposed to be good is that out on dvd and all that stuff i do not know i haven't been following burton too terribly much like um and i really haven't even been following johnny depp either um I think I kind of gave up with Big Fish. I I wasn't really a big fan of Big Fish. And then I felt that Secondhand Lions just kind of blew it out of the water for the same sort of thing. Yeah. Um, uh, The book Big Big Fish is really, really good. Yeah. Because it was a book originally, and it's it's very, very good. Yeah. I, 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 that's a good one. Secondhand Lions would have to be like in my top 100 somewhere. I just fucking love that movie. You know? Really? Oh, God, yeah. Oh, yeah. Especially with Haley Joe Osmond being on that cusp where he's just barely, barely passing for cute. And you yeah. Can, you could tell in any second he's going to become a dork. He's just going to become a dorky teenager, you know? All yeah. gangly and awkward and all that <laughs> usually they come back out of it though Haley Joe did not make it back out of that phase <laughs> speaking of Haley Joel Osment did you have did you ever see the spoils of Babylon no oh, that was a, it, a little mini series on uh, Netflix wasn't it yeah it was a mini series parody of mini series like, like it, it was a parody of miniseries, like like the Thorn Birds and stuff like that. Yeah. And it's it, it. I'm surprised that it was on IFC, 
and I'm surprised that people don't know more about it because the cast is amazing because it's uh, Will Ferrell's in it and Toby McGro- Toby McGuire and really? Kristen Wiig, uh, Jessica Alba, uh, and uh, Haley Joel Osment is in it a lot. Really, he plays like the evil the evil son who's trying to take down the. Yeah, it's absolutely amazing. I believe it's on Netflix. That's where I saw it. I don't know if it's still there, but it's quite amazing. Yeah. Uh, I, I remember when I first saw it, I'm like, how come I've never heard of this before? How come <laughs> people are not freaking out over this? This is amazing. <laughs> Val Kilmer's like the evil army guy. Yeah. It's, Haley, it's, Haley it's, Joe would be great for Val Kilmer's son. Yeah. I think that could be good cast, casting. There's kind of a resemblance going on there. Yeah, especially since... Uh, Val Kilmer's become a uh, like a wackadoo. He's become a wackadoo. He's become a wackadoo. Yes. Um, Val Kilmer's become a bit of a wackadoo. Jeff Bridges has definitely turned the wackadoo corner, except that he yeah. has he has done it in a very delightful way. He's become the fucking dude. He just is the dude. Yeah. Um, yeah. I occasionally listen to the Nerdist podcast because yeah. they get some very famous people. Basically, I look at their podcasts and see who's on, and if I don't like it, I just don't listen to it. Fucking Jeff Bridges had them in a meditation circle, oming for <laughs> for ten fucking minutes. Really? <laughs> and I was like, "That's amazing." He is. He, you got to hear that one. You got to at least hear that one. He is the dude. <laughs> yeah, he wrote a um. He wrote like an Eastern religious book, like a year or two ago. Yeah. Yeah, and we sell it. We sell it fairly regularly. It's called something along the lines of like the, the the Buddhist and the dude or something like that. Don't remember the specific title, but it's supposed to be amazing. Yeah, uh, you know, I mean, yes, the spoils, the spoils of Babylon is still on Netflix. You should see it. It's amazing. Cool. Absolutely amazing. I, I have noticed over the course of my life how. Great actors. Eventually go fucking nuts. Yes. Think of some of the great actors. In pretty much our time, the great movies and things like that. and. Look at them now. Dustin Hoffman is out of his fucking yeah. mind. So is Al Pacino. So is De Niro. Yeah. They're insane. I have a theory. Yeah. I have yes. a theory that you are putting so much into your characters. Okay? Like, you you lick your pinky and brush back your eyebrow. Things like this. Oh, this mm-hmm. this character will do that. This character will do this. This character will do that. And as they get older, everything that they do personally is like, I I did that in the movie Heat, <laughs> you know, so that yeah. they they are not like fully actualized people anymore, you know. They're a collection of all the characters they played, and everything they do and everything they say, they can relate back to some character. And I think it drives them nuts. That's a good point. You might be right about that. Jim Carrey's going a bit nuts right now, too. And speaking of... Well, that that shit turned kick-ass, too, was fucking weird. Yes. Yes, it was. Where he's in the movie, he's getting paid to be in the movie, and then suddenly he turns on the movie... As the movie's coming out, it's like, who does that? That one, I really kind of, I mean, it was weird, and I don't know for a fact, but I really kind of suspect that one of a publicity stunt. Yeah, that possibly. But who besides, who besides Anne Rice gets paid for a movie and then immediately tries to get the people against the very movie that they just got paid for? Yeah. You know? Yeah. Oh, I, I saw the interview recently, too. Have you seen that one yet? No, I have not. I have not seen that. It, and it's on Netflix, too, but I have, I'm have i having a hard time with Netflix. Oh, yeah? 
Yeah, I a lot of times when I watch TV, I don't want to pay attention. I want I want the TV to be on, but I don't want to watch TV. Yeah. So I'll 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 turn on Netflix and it's just do you want to watch these eight seasons? And it's just no, I I, I just <laughs> want to watch something that I don't have to pay attention to. I don't I can't watch Arrested Development. I'll have to pay attention to what this character said to that character, but that character is actually thinking that this character said that, and this character is over here doing that, and it's like, no, I don't want to do homework. Mm -hmm. Just want to watch something fun and entertaining, and then forget about it. Well, that's why I go with a a lot of documentaries, you know? Yeah. Because it makes good background noise until something happens that makes you turn your head and go like, what the fuck? (laughs) What happened? <laughs> you know, well, so yeah, interviews on interviews on my playlist. Oh, I I I bet I'll eventually get to it. It's not the best out of uh the Seth Rogen James Franco pairings. Probably because Judge Ap- Judd Apatow didn't direct, you know. But I liked it a lot. I liked it quite a bit. Yeah. It was just stupid fun, you know. I kept thinking that that might be a good um, movie to do on the podcast, but only because I I want to occasionally pepper the podcast with something that is really popular and that people know, you know? Uh, I have something I need to let the people know. (laughs) What? Um, So speaking about documentaries, and I forget what the hell this one is called. I find a documentary on Netflix and I put it on. What the hell? And it is about this Australian woman where they're going to begin fracking in the neighborhood playground. Okay. (laughs) So she decides to make a short film to dissuade everybody from letting this happen. So she realized that she needed to make a propaganda film. So she goes to North Korea Wow. Where she says they are the best at propaganda ever. (laughs) Okay. And the documentary goes on from there. But man, it's fucked up. You know? Yeah. Everything is our glorious leader this, our glorious leader that. And I found out from this documentary that Kim Jong Il made wrote a book about filmmaking. That's so odd because I was just I I was about to read a book. Uh it, it was at work and I saw it and I'm like, oh this is odd. It it's it's called a Kim Jong il production. Yeah. The true story of a kidnapped filmmaker, his star act and something like that. It's by Paul Fisher, and it's about this story in the 70s where apparently Kim Jong-il was in charge of um, the Ministry of Propaganda. Yeah. So he he was the producer and screenwriter and director of every movie that was made in North Korea from like the 70s and 80s and stuff like that. <laughs> he made that weird he made that weird Godzilla knockoff film Oh, I forgot what it was called. Pulgasari or something like that. I, I, I like I had no idea that he was making his own that he was making all of the North Korean movies. Yeah. Well, they now have Over a production there. company, but this book is available for free in PDF format at archive.org. Really? So I have it, and I am so going to read that shit. <laughs> I want to see what Kim Jong-il has to say. <laughs> well, that's interesting. Our glorious leader. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if he would take a piss in a urinal, they would, they would immediately electroplate it in gold and yes. hang a fucking sign over it. Our glorious leader pissed here. <laughs> it's a really fucked up documentary. Uh, and I kind of recommend it. It was a little on the boring side, though. But sort of. It's At least watch the North Koreans being weird for a little while. Um, there is currently uh, a documentary about Hustler magazine. 
Nice. Yeah, that was pretty interesting. That was pretty interesting. Uh, so we're going to just keep avoiding Orgy of the Dead <laughs> for about another hour. Well, I tried I tried segueing, and I said, speaking of Tim Burton, but then you interrupted with the, that whole North, with the, the interview. You interrupted me with the interview. Oh, uh, sorry about that. <laughs> no, it's okay. It's okay. Uh, today's, this week's podcast is all about Orgy of the Dead. But um, I hope you do not think that this whole podcast will be about Ed Wood because Ed Wood did not direct this movie. Oh, he didn't direct this movie? No, he did not. Oh. It's Ed Wood's Orgy of the Dead in the same way that Tim Burton's Nightmare Before Christmas wasn't directed by Tim Burton. Right. Because Nightmare Before Christmas, Tim Burton's Nightmare Before Christmas was based on um, Tim Burton or Christmas, but it was directed by Henry Selick, which okay. is some guy nobody's ever heard of. But most people assume that, OK, Tim Burton directed this. No, he wrote the script and and all that, but he didn't he didn't make Nightmare Before Christmas. Which is why in 2001, Henry Selleck released this really shitty movie called Monkey Bone. Monkey you ever see Bone that? with, uh, I think Brandon Fraser was in that. Yeah, Brandon Fraser. Yeah. But the previews all said from the director of The Nightmare Before Christmas. So like 75% of America said, what? Tim Burton has a new movie out? I'm totally going to go see this. <laughs> And then they went to go see it and realized, oh, wait, this is shit. And it it isn't a Tim Burton movie. Uh, fuck this guy. I I have to come out and say I like Brandon Fraser. Really? I can't help it. I, I just there's another movie on Netflix right now called uh, Furry Fury. And it's starring him. And there's just Furry. something about it that. Uh, about a lot of Brandon Fraser's movies or Brandon Fraser, whatever, um, that reminds me of older Disney flubber movies, yeah, and things like that. It's stupid. Furry Fury, I think so. Furry Vengeance, Furry. There we go. Yeah, I remember that movie. Yeah, we're like him and like all the. Yeah, I remember that movie. Yeah, he gets attacked by raccoons. That's all you really need yeah. to know. <laughs> he was he was good in all of those mummy movies. I mean, I had no problem with that. Yeah. That first mummy movie was pretty darn good. And speaking of mummies, <laughs> was there was, a zipper was... in the back of that suit? <laughs> yes, there definitely was. There definitely was a zipper in the back of the suit. Well, see, I pay attention I, I wanted, I came up with this. I came up with this yesterday. And I came up with this yesterday and I was really proud of it. So people eat food, but they pay attention to the ingredients that they, oh, if I'm going to put this in my body, right. I want to, I want to see what I'm putting into my body. I want to, I want to know what, what things I'm putting in there. Right. That's essentially what I do with movie posters. Mm -hmm. I always pay attention to movie posters. I want to see who the director is. I want to see who wrote this thing. I want to see who's starring in this, who I may not have seen in the trailers, because I am also going to put this movie in my body. It's going to go through my eyes. It's going to go into my brain. And I want to pay attention to what <laughs> I'm putting inside of my brain. Okay. I pay attention to the ingredients of the movie. Well, see, I'm fat, so I don't do that with my food, and I <laughs> don't do that with my movies either. It's kind of like, I heard this is shit. Let me check it out. <laughs> yeah. I, I also like looking at the rating of the movie and then the specific reason why it's rated that way. Oh, yeah, yeah, like, yeah. I remember they made an animated Star Wars The Clone Wars movie, and it said rated PG for sci-fi like violence and brief smoking. Brief smoking. I had seen yeah. one that said simulated smoking. 
simulated smoking. Yeah. That's, that's even more amazing. <laughs> but people should pay attention to the ingredients of a movie. Mm -hmm. Because Tim Burton did not direct Nightmare Before Christmas and Ed Wood did not direct Orgy of the Dead. Um, Which was basically is, three little movies if you break it down. What, Orgy of the Dead? Yeah. It was Criswell and the fake Vampirella. Yes. There were the couple in the car crash. Mm hmm. And strippers. Yeah. I do like Bob and Shirley, though. Bob and Shirley. Yeah. I do like Bob and Shirley. She was way too much of a prude for me, you know. Yeah, but the good thing is, the good thing is, is that she also doubles as the gold girl. Oh, she did. Okay. Yeah. Who is the, the that's the third dance. So I remember when I first saw the movie and was obsessed with the movie when, you know, in like the 90s, I was like, oh, man, I love that girl who plays Shirley, but you never get to see her nude. And then I realized, <laughs> oh, wait, you see her nude all the time throughout the whole damn movie. I just didn't know it. This movie was directed by a man named Stephen C. Apostoloff. He also okay. went by the name A.C. He also went by the name A.C. Stevens, and that's the name that he goes by in this movie. Uh -huh. um, and I love this man. In fact, for the last decade, I have been on and off in talks with a documentary film crew from Bulgaria. Uh -huh. And for the last like decade, they've been working on a movie version, a documentary on the life of Stephen C. Apostoloff, because he's from Bulgaria. And so I've I've been in talks a number of times since like, oh, where are you? Where are you now, Steve? You're in Oklahoma. OK, we will fly down there. We need to interview you. We need to okay. talk to you about A.C. Stevens and his work. So I've 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 really looked into this man's life and he is amazing. This man has had the most amazing life. Stephen C. Apostoloff. That's an amazing name, first yes. off. Yes, it C. is. C. Apostoloff is an amazing name. He is sort of like a master of low-budget exploitation slash erotic-ish films. Here are some of the titles of the movies that he, he made. You can understand the type of movies that he made just by the titles of some of the movies that he made. So here are some of them. Okay. The Beach Bunnies. Mm -hmm. Five Loose Women. Okay. Uh, dropout wife. <laughs> yeah, dropout wife. And then this is my. She's favorite trying to get title. her GED. Yeah, and he just keeps dropping out. <laughs> and then this is my favorite title: Office Lovin' White Collar Style. <laughs> That's a great title. It's a bit on the long side, but I love that title. So. Uh, Stephen C. Apostoloff, he was born in Bulgaria in 1928, and he died in 2005 in Mesa, Arizona. Oh, OK. It says a lot about someone that you're born, you know, in Bulgaria, but then end up dying all dry and shriveled in freaking Mesa, <laughs> which is weird. So now his movies would they have been considered porn or would they have been considered like the nudie cutie genre or something like that? Sort of nudie cuties. He and, was a and orgy of the dead itself. Was that kind of like maybe the gateway for Ed Wood doing more pornographic films? Definitely. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Stephen C. Apostoloff really did kind of usher Ed Wood into the next part of his life. But here's a little bit about his life, the life of Stephen C. Apostoloff. As a teenager, he joined the rebellion against the communist regime in Bulgaria. I mean, he literally fought. I mean, guns and and um, literally fighting against the regime. And he was caught and was thrown in prison for a while. He eventually escaped prison and escaped the country and bounced around the globe. For a while, he uh, was a member of the French Foreign Legion. Oh, wow. For, for a while, he lived in the woods of Canada. And then eventually, like all Bulgarians one day dream of doing, 
He got a job as an accountant in a Bank of America in California. Mm -hmm. Like all Bulgarians dream of doing. It's, it, well, any bank is full of them. Yeah. And that's how he got started in Hollywood, because he went from being an accountant at a Bank of America to being an accountant for various movie studios. And that's how he he got involved in so-called Hollywood. The guy has had an absolutely amazing life, and he really worked with and collaborated with Ed Wood throughout the entire 1950s and 60s, in 1960s and 70s. Like it, he was really good friends with Ed Wood until edward's death which is why in my religion woodism i canonized stephen apostoloff as the patron saint of pornographers <laughs> despite the fact that he's not a, a pornographer more like a nudie cutie but yeah. it's all semantics i was surprised when i looked up stephen c apostoloff on wikipedia that the church of edward was mentioned nice and it says at the end, like the last bit there, that the Church of Ed Wood canonized Stephen C. Apostolov. And I'm like, ooh, look at that. I'm on Wikipedia and there's me again. Mm -hmm. That's so weird that I've forcefully injected myself into these famous people's lives. But, you know, whatever. But this is Ed Wood's Orgy of the Dead. It's based on one of his novels, Orgy of the Dead, the book. Ed would wrote roughly 80 something books during the last like decade or two of his life. He was a master of the quick write. It mentions in the book uh, Nightmare of Ecstasy by Rudolph Gray. Uh, Kathy Wood talks about how amazed she was that Ed would just get a, a bottle of whiskey and put on an Angora sweater and get his beaten up typewriter and just go nuts on that typewriter. And in a day or two, he would have a novel that he would go off and sell to some guy and he'd make a quick 50 or a hundred bucks off of that. Right. And then he would keep doing it over and over again. The last decades of his life, he was just a master of it's he's written 80 something books because he didn't always go as Ed Wood. He had at least 20 different aliases that we know of, Uh huh. but he would be constantly writing books. But one of the things that was always a, a, a staple in anything that Ed Wood wrote was that just like Glenn had a female uh, counterpoint called Glenda, when Ed Wood dressed in drag, he called him he called himself Shirley. Right. So there are a lot of women wearing Angora sweaters named Shirley in his movies and scripts, mm -hmm. which is why in Orgy of the Dead. Which is a complete and total lie. There is no orgy in this movie. <laughs> it is very, very. This is the one of the tamest movies with one of the untamest names yeah. ever. You must have read Hollywood Rat Race too, right? Oh yes, I did. Yeah, That's one of my that... favorite self-help books because it's mm -hmm. a self-help book to try and say, "Hey, you want to make it in Hollywood? Here's a tip: stay at home." because <laughs> yeah. you're stupid for wanting to go to hollywood that's basically the entire thesis and, of edward's hollywood rat race and it kind of continued that with sort of an overall theme of here's what i did don't do that yep <laughs> yep it's the closest ed wood got to writing an autobiography and it's still in print it's quite an amazing read i love the fact that in that book he talks about visiting Disneyland and yeah. going to the Circle Vision <laughs> and talking about how that is definitely going to be the future of movies. Yeah. That soon everyone will be watching movies in Circle Vision theaters. <laughs> he was a bit off on that. Yeah. Because so far there are no IMAX Circle Visions that I know of. But still, that allowed me to make Disneyland a, a a holy, a holy place. Yes. Well, what brought that up in my mind is there was a passage of him on a beach as Shirley talking to somebody. Um, and they were just talking. Nothing was going on or anything like that. But how scared he was because he knew that there were cops in the area. Mm, and yeah. he he could just be arrested for being dressed like that. You know, so there's a lot of poignancy to his life as well. 
Yeah. Very true. So the script for Orgy of the Dead is ridiculously short. There's an interview How in... can it be long, man? I'm thinking maybe 10-page script? Well, what was the name? A Look Back in Angora. That was it. A Look Back in Angora. They interview Stephen Apostoloff in that. Yeah. And Stephen Apostoloff says, Eddie, what is this? This script is only like 15, 20 pages. I can't film this. So it was Ed's idea to pad the movie with a series of burlesque style strip teases that are all horrible to watch. <laughs> yeah. Some worse than others. Yes. And we might have to vote and discuss who we think was just the worst. Seriously, for a film called Orgy of the Dead, this movie is like ridiculously tame. This is a surprisingly ridiculously tame movie. I would like to take this time to say that there have been two pornographic films uh, based on Ed Wood's movies. Uh, I the first one, uh, well, they, they were hard to find, and I spent way too much money when I was in high school, uh, college, looking for these movies. But the first one was called Plan 69 from Outer Space. <laughs> okay. They don't use the original script. It's more like a like a like a pornographic parody of Plan 9. But the other one is worth noting. It's called Glenn and Glenda. Okay. As opposed to Glenn or Glenda. And it's it uses about 80% of the original script from Glenn or Glenda. Nice. Yeah. But the thing is is that when the guy dresses up as a woman, he they automatically switch to a really attractive uh, fake breasted woman. Mm -hmm. a, her name, uh, Caitlin Ashley. That was her name. I remember her name, Caitlin Ashley. She looked very plastic and very fake and like she had a serious addiction problem. Is this available anywhere? Like uh, you porn or? I found it. I found it online. I, I couldn't find Plan 69 from Outer Space, but I did find Glenn and Glenda. Yeah, that I found that's still around somewhere. I found it. I I looked for it last night and I found it at some place that specializes in classic porn movies. Um, for a while. For a while, when I was in college, I was actually in talks to remake the movie Orgy of the Dead. Really? OK. And as a as a hardcore pornographic movie. Hmm. It where was this? So it, I was in I was in college. I was I was at Arizona State University and I was starting work on the like turning the Church of Ed Wood into a serious religion. Right. And I I was contacted by a you know a bunch of people throughout America they throughout the world that were just like oh hey I love what you're doing with the page and it's really great and I love Ed Wood and this one guy contacted me and he lived um in southern Texas and what he would do was he would get like 200 300 dollars together and he would come up with an idea for a porn movie and then he would hop the border to Mexico and film it really cheap and then bring it to America and sell it for a large amount of money. And he would just he would end up making like five or ten different porn movies a year by just finding a bunch of skanks in Mexico to to do it with. <laughs> and then he would he, he made like. He was a millionaire because of the movies he would do. So when I heard when I when he told me that the first thing I said was, you know what you should do, you should make a pornographic version of orgy of the dead because orgy of the dead is the most misleading title in the world so for a while he had me writing a script i guess i could say that i was in post-production but there were serious talks he wanted me to go down and film it he wanted me to play the criswell character and i was using the majority of the original script but i also wanted it to be kind of funny and tongue-in-cheek and and yeah it was a serious serious thing i was in pre-production on a porn movie yeah you you definitely would have been in pre-production at that point yeah 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 we were really talking about it and he actually he said oh well i'm doing a, i'm doing a movie next week and i'll go down and uh look to see if there are any 
uh, actual graveyards in Mexico that we could film this at. I'm sure that if I bribed the police that we could do this. And so we were, we were seriously going to do this movie. Yeah. That's a shame you didn't do it though. That would be an experience. Mm-hmm. That would be an experience. Oh. I was, I had written a uh, mad slasher script and I was kind of, it, it fairly close in the beginning. There's a sex scene. And I was considering if I shoot that, I would get actual porn actors and just shoot it as a porn. Just that sequence. Yeah. You know, like, okay, this this is a mad slasher. This these are the things we do. I'm going further than you did. Yeah. <laughs> you know. For a while he was trying to convince me to actually do some of the sex scenes in the movie. And I'm like, Oh no, I can't do that. Yeah. Can't do that at all. Cause because I, I don't want, I don't want my face to be seen in this movie. Cause you're, but then he men. said, <laughs> yeah. But then he said, well, you know, you can always just be the wolf man or the mummy. That way people won't know it's you. Uh-huh, okay. So for a while I was seriously considering acting in my first porn movie. <laughs> That was in pre-production for. I was going to write it and star in it. These are the weird stories. I've got a million weird stories like this. Mm-hmm. I was uh, once I was once cast to be in a in a, a television show that was in pre-production. Yeah, they hired me because they had seen they had seen um, me doing story time, and they thought, well, this is going to be a kid's show, but it's going to be a different type of kid's show. It's going to be very funny and artistic and loud and in your face, and you'd be perfect. And so I talked with them for a while, and they cast me. They said, you'd be perfect, Mr. Steve. It's going to be it's going to be pretty much it's going to be like a Monty Python, but for but for today's modern Christian children. Oh, and it's like, oh, man, you only know me as the storyteller. You have no idea what I've got going on, do you? <laughs> so I quietly backed out of that. And then Jesus turned into a rabbit yeah. and hid eggs. Yeah. Did I, uh, just speaking strange stories, did I ever uh-huh. tell you my Omni Magazine story? Whoa. Okay. Omni Magazine. No. You have not told me this. So I have pretty much been a writer all my life. Mm -hmm. Uh, And my parents were like totally not supportive and shit. I would have to save up my my allowance to buy like manila envelopes and postage and paper and shit. And I would sit there and I would write short stories. And I was about 11, 12, maybe 13. Okay. And I had written a short story. And at the time, Omni magazine hadn't been out for too terribly long. And it was just like my favorite magazine since, you know, um, Famous Monsters went under. You know, this was yeah. this was like the next step in my evolution from Famous Monsters was to Omni magazine. And they used to have um, fiction. You know, they would have short stories in the magazine. I was like, OK, well, I've written a short story. And of course it sucked because I was young, but I didn't know. Uh, and I was kind of uh, like, well, you know, I take a shot. What difference does it make? Um, so I was like, I'll, I'll, I'll send it to Omni Magazine. Maybe it'll get published. So um, we lived out on Long Island and my parents were always really freaky about um, like long distance phone calls and shit. Okay. Yeah. So I had to wait for my parents to not be home. <laughs> And then I called New York Information because the address for Omni Magazine is on the front cover. Yeah. Okay. The inside cover. So I call Information and they give me the phone number. So now I'm already kind of nervous. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to submit something to a magazine as a writer. Okay. So I'm already nervous. And I call, once I get my bravery up again, I call and I hear, hello, Penthouse Magazine, 
Because <laughs> Penthouse, Penthouse published Omni. Yeah. I, I think maybe his kid did it or something like that. I, I forget. But they published it. <laughs> so now I, I now I'm 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 an eleven year old Jackie Gleason where I'm just like humming 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 and I, I finally managed to croak out what it is I need through this incredibly tense boner that I have because I am <laughs> talking to a woman from Penthouse Magazine and I know exactly what she looks like. <laughs> right. I can just picture her in my head, you know? Damn. Short skirt, leg spread. Oh yeah, and I'm like, uh, uh, I I want want to make a submission to, to um, Omni Magazine, <laughs> and she was very nice. <laughs> she didn't laugh or anything. She was like, "Oh, I can help you. It's okay. Let me get you that that address, and you're going to be sending it to Mr. Ben Bova." who is the editor-in-chief of the fiction department. Uh, ben Bova, who is a fairly famous science fiction, famous science yeah, fiction writer. Yeah, I was going to say, that's, that's a name I definitely know. So I write down all the information, I hang up the phone, and I go fuck the dog. Okay. Or at least that's how I remember it. Something. Okay. Something. My, my little 11-year-old body explodes loaded somehow <laughs> ah gotcha and that is pretty much uh the end of that story except later on in life when i was about 19 and i was working in manhattan at the time and i was just walking down the street going to lunch or something like that i have no idea and just like looking around at all the buildings and things like that passing the new york uh, headquarters of Scientology, by the way. Hi, guys. Um, you know, and walking by, you know, that state when you just do not have your mind on anything at all? Yeah. Which allows something really fucked up to just jump in there? <laughs> yeah. So that's what I'm doing. I'm just walking down the street, and all of a sudden, I made a realization. And I stopped on the corner of 7th Avenue. And thought to myself, I addressed that envelope to Mr. Ben Dover. <laughs> I wrote it down wrong. <laughs> I had other things on my mind at the time. You know what? That may have killed your chances. <laughs> Mr. I'm thinking. Mr. Possibly. Bendover, I, I, I would doubt he would even open it after that. <laughs> right? You know, oh, this is just going to be an 8x10 glossy of my face with, like, knives in it. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah. So that is my strange, amusing story for this episode. Damn. <laughs> okay. So, <laughs> Orgy of the Dead starts out. Just like Manos. Just like fucking Manos is how it started out. With them in a car driving down the damn road. No, I, but before I got chills. <laughs> before that's before that happens, Ed Wood rips off himself. So to understand the introduction, we gotta like do a little bit of like backwards back talking here. Okay. So Ed Wood made Bride of the Monster in 1955. It's a very old school mad scientist monster movie. It's probably one of the normalist movies that Ed Wood ever made. It's it's it one of his best at all around yeah. as as a filmmaker story-wise, you know, things like that. And the movie the the Ed Wood movie uh did not portray Bride of the Monster or Bride of the Atom. Um fairly no it did not but apparently it did it and it made a decent amount of money unfortunately in order to get the movie completed ed wood signed away way more than 100 percent of the rights to the film so he kind of screwed himself over with that but um 
he he made a direct sequel to Bride of the Monster, which was and that Night was of the Ghouls, right? Night of the Ghouls, which he made in 1959. But he couldn't afford to uh, to to pay the the people who were editing it and all of that sort of stuff. So it went completely unreleased. It, in fact, the movie wasn't released until 1984 when Wade Williams paid that tab and gained the rights to Ed Wood's movie. It was essentially just it, it was done. It's just no one ever paid the bill. Yeah. To the printer or whatever until Wade Williams came along. So it makes sense. I say all this because it makes sense that when they were looking for an introduction to Orgy of the Dead, that Ed Wood said, I have an idea. Let's just do the opening of Night of the Ghouls. And that's what they do in the beginning where you see the 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 crypt and suddenly Criswell slowly rises up from inside and mm-hmm. he does his speech gr- greetings my f- i am criswell monsters to be pitied monsters, monsters to be despised, to be despised. <laughs> a night of the ghouls he even says the movie that he's ripping off i even i even though that yeah you know and actually that now that you mentioned that that took me back a little bit like that yeah that was weird <laughs> yeah, that was a weird line. I love Chris Weld. I just love Chris Weld. Yeah, man. I it's I, I wish I had remember. one. <laughs> it's important to 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 realize. You know, it's really fun to to look back at all of Ed Wood's movies and to kind of like laugh and all that. But Chris Weld was a big deal. Yeah, in his time, Chris Weld was a big deal. He he um. He published a couple of books. He released a record. He was a regular on the Jack Parr show. He was a regular on the Tonight Show. Johnny Carson loved Criswell. There's a video on YouTube somewhere of Criswell on the Johnny Carson show, and he's doing his prediction shtick, and Johnny Carson's sitting right next to him and listening to everything, and he thinks it's just amazing, and Criswell's going, uh, saying these stupid things, and then you, you just see Johnny Carson there. Really, that's gonna happen. I that's amazing, Ed. Did you know that? Did you know that that's gonna happen? Mm-hmm. <laughs> he loved Criswell. He had his own. He had a syndicated newspaper column. Criswell did, and he had his own freaking TV show. He had a syndicated television show, <laughs> the Criswell Show. But he is he in any Ed movie, Edward movie. He is always just so beautifully over the top you know Absolutely. i mean he's he's taking it he's oh, he's taking it seriously but he can't act absolutely cannot you know and in and, this movie in yeah. orgy of the dead he was like in his uh what 50s or 60s at this period in time yeah. and so edward uh in the movie he he kind of did a bunch of things for orgy of the dead and he was a uh, he was a like a manager and he was a this and he was a that and he he was the what's it called? He was the cue card guy for Criswell. Yeah. He held up the big huge cue cards because he couldn't remember his lines. <laughs> and it's it's painfully obvious <laughs> that like 60 year old Criswell is reading all of this from a freaking cue card. Poor guy. Yeah. Poor Criswell. He's just so old in this movie. But those are the only entertaining bits. <laughs> yes. Him and the now and the I Vampirella ripoff. Wolfman and the Mummy. Yes. It's like, wow, thank you, Captain uh Captain um Thank you, Captain Segway. <laughs> yeah. First, first time I've ever heard a wolfman speak. Yes, that freaking howling is just horrible. It's obviously just this guy screaming. You're not even trying to howl. You're not even howling right. I, I like the whole do he had going on with the white stripes up the side. You know, really yeah. kind of distinguished looking wolfman going on there. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so the movie. 
Bob and Shirley are driving down the road. What is with Bob's voice? That is the strangest voice that I've ever heard. It's like a mm-hmm. it's like a high pitched Ray Romano. <laughs> My monsters have done well for me. <laughs> Your Puritan um upbringing holds you back from my monsters but it doesn't hold back your art of kissing mm-hmm. is, it's like, what the heck? what is with his voice is only one monster I want Shirley to be interested in yeah. <laughs> nice Shirley was played by Pat Barrington and this was her first movie, but apparently she spent the next uh, four or five years becoming a legendary burlesque dancer. What's, uh, what's her name again? Pat Barrington. Pat Barrington. Okay. Yeah. Apparently she's a semi-famous um, burlesque dancer. Yeah, I've so, I've had occasion to go and look up burlesque on uh, archive.org a couple of times. You know, yeah, because it makes nice little goofy inserts here and there, you know, yeah, um, you know, so like I got some of Betty Page and things like that, just kind of names that um I've heard of, but I don't know why I've heard of them, yeah. you know, like Vera Lynn, yeah, f- from Pink Lily F- Saint Seer, well, Vera, Vera Lynn from the from the uh, Pink Floyd song, yeah, like, that's what she was, she was a burlesque, burlesque dancer, yeah. That's why I thought of Lily St. Cyr from, from Rocky Horror Picture Show. Yeah. So Bob and Shirley are driving down the road. They get into an accident, and then they come upon a cemetery where Criswell is there, and he plays... What the fuck is he doing in this movie? He is almost a Dracula or Satan-type character. And this is basically their nightly entertainment. Um, oh man! On was... Wikipedia, they call his character a demon, but it's like, no, he's not a demon. Yeah, he's just some sort of weird undead person who judges people as to do they go on in the afterlife. It's essentially this entire movie is essentially so you think you can dance for strippers. <laughs> yeah. So now, now Bob and Shirley get into the accident. OK, yeah. And they come upon that graveyard. And at this point, I'm like, all right, I know how this movie ends. I've seen this. I've seen this like a million times in a million other movies. And I was fucking wrong. Can how you did you think it was going to end? Well, Bob and Shirley were dead all along. Oh, yes. Very much. Uh, you know, like uh, like we've seen that like hundreds of times since Jacob's Ladder, which is the first yeah. one I could really think of that in modern times anyway, yeah. that, that did that and did it very like well. Our, like our old sponsor, the drab gray dress warehouse. <laughs> Are yeah. you in the tri-state area? Do you need a drab gray dress? Then come on down to the drab, drab gray dress warehouse. <laughs> <laughs> and if that you and if you good, enter though. promo code pop on film <laughs> <laughs> but he's not like he's not a demon he's just he's just judging dead sunset boulevard strippers it's difficult to explain the, what this movie is when suddenly Criswell and um uh, vampira knockoff show up uh-huh. So essentially, they're there, and if Criswell's not pleased by tonight's entertainment, then everyone's going to hell. So he is he a demon? It's 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 all quite confusing, but it all sets up these ten dances, these ten different uh, strip teases. Uh, a few of them are racist. Mm-hmm. Some of them are absolutely horrible, but mm-hmm. okay. So let's break this down. Okay, and if and and these are the only strippers that can make that you just available? break down and cry. Yeah, yeah. Um. So uh, the first one 
is the Indian dance. <laughs> yes. They have these names in the opening credits that are just Indian dance, gold dance, Mexican dance, mm-hmm. fluff dance. <laughs> uh, now, fluff dance. No, band name. Called it. Fluff, fluff dance. dance. She fluff she dance. is not. She's in like my runner up list for the worst. Which one? The the Indian. But I do that, not. That one's okay. I, 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 there's one there that I find much, much worse. <laughs> would that would that be the the skeleton? No. That one, the zombie? No, I got to go with the bride. Stop! Oh no, that's the skeleton dance because she's dancing with the skeleton. The bride uh, with the veil and everything, and she's yeah. like, she's like dancing yeah she's she's trying to twirl her boob but it, it 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 makes it seem like she's having like a like a spasm or something it's the michael j fox dance like like paramedics should be called <laughs> yeah okay so the first one is the indian dance the song features a lot of hi-ya, 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 which, so it's it's all a bit racist uh number two is the street walker right uh, one who prowls the lonely streets at night in life is bound to prowl them in eternity. <laughs> yeah. um, it, it, it's a it's it's not the best dance. It's like she's really tired, like she needs some coffee. But I'll get into this later when we talk about the homework. Great fucking music. Now, what I found in this movie with watching the strippers uh, with this being an older film and it being on YouTube and, you know, not having like a, an updated print or anything like that. Some of the strippers looked like they didn't have nipples. Really? Yeah. And it was like, See, I, I, have a DV, I have a DVD of the movie. So I watched the actual DVD. I didn't watch it on the YouTubies. Yeah. So I'm not exactly they had nipples on my version some of them had nipples on my version that is interesting but the street walker the second dance that's a really good dance that music that's a song it's a really amazing song and i really like the third song too that's the gold dance i I remember both of those being fairly better 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 acts um Better stripping. Throw gold at her. <laughs> yes. <laughs> More gold. More gold. That is wonderful. How much chocolate do you think that was? <laughs> A lot of chocolate. <laughs> For all eternity, she shall have gold. Yeah. And then they dump her in the the the, which be they dump her body in like melting gold, and so now she'll be gold forever. But wait a second. You're in a, aren't you all ghosts? I mean, aren't you all already dead? Yeah. So, so you just dumped a ghost in gold? I, that, it really makes no sense. It really <laughs> makes no sense. But it's obvious that someone saw um, Goldfinger. Uh, which came out first? Uh, Goldfinger came out first. Oh, okay. And then Orgy of the Dead. So it's obvious that somebody watched Goldfinger. Yeah. And so then, after the gold girl is when the wolfman and the mummy show up, and their costumes um, were done by Rick Baker, and they cost $10 million each. Ooh. No. Did I say $10 million? I meant... $10? Uh, yes, I meant $10. <laughs> That's how much their costumes cost, is $10 <laughs> at the Walgreens on the corner. Where they said, I need a wolfman and a mummy mask. And they said, well, I've got these, but um, they're not the best quality. They were ripped by a mad dog and they were peed on. And they said, well, we need them now. We'll take them. And that's the wolfman and the mummy. And it's obvious the what the mummy's the one that's talking and the wolfman just screams. Like, oh, like really horrible. <laughs> the mummy's the one who's doing the talking, but... They didn't. It really does seem like they're miking him f- while he's talking inside of the mask. Yes, because all of his dialogue just sounds like 
I remember when <laughs> that happened. Cleopatra had a hero. It's like, that was not uh, the best thinking on their part. Mm-hmm. But after after the Wolfman and the Mummy, they get they get Bob and Shirley, so they're tied up. Tie them so that they may watch. Well, because Bob and Shirley had to get closer so they wouldn't be seen. Yes. So they're tied up, and Shirley says, "Fiends, fiends!" <laughs> and then, and I like that. This is like the the Leva of the movie, I think. She goes, fiends, fiends, which is n- no one who was just tied up by like by like a, a dead demon woman would ever say that. Like, who goes to that first? <laughs> oh, no, I've been tied up at this graveyard in a cemetery and, and I'm going to I'm going to die. Fiends. Well, they, Fiends! Yeah, it, they're, they're really more steps there. I don't know all of the steps, but first is begging and pleading. And then there's usually an offer of money of some sort. <laughs> and somewhere along the line there you get to Fiends! 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 Yeah. Fiends! But then, uh, Gualita, I think is the name that they, they give her in the movie. She responds with one of the most weirdest out of left field lines in the world because Shirley says, fiends, fiends. And apparently in response to that, uh, Gulita's answer is to love the cat is to be the cat, (laughs) which sets up the next dance, the cat dance. But still, if you tie somebody up and they start yelling fiend at you. Mm-hmm. Apparently, what you're supposed to say is, oh, ah. uh, that is also an ex- to love the cat is to be the cat. I mean, what do you expect? I mean, to love the cat is to be the cat. That's just how it is. But that is an example of how bad these strippers are that in a movie full of strippers, I think Gulita is the hottest one. Yes. Yes, and she's never naked, and it's quite a shame. The chick with the clothes on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I want to see more of her. And then, God damn it, the cat dance. <laughs> the cat dance. It's a catchy little ditty. I like the song. And uh, I really, it, Criswell does seem to get into that one. It was a better costume, but. Yeah. You know, man, it's, you know, I can't think of the last time I saw a stripper stripping to the alley cat and doing the alley cat across stage. You know, you just don't see that. Yeah. There was one time, there was one time. Standards gone. (laughs) Yeah. There was one time I was, I was in Phoenix and I was living with my parents and I was 21 or 22 years old and, and I was driving home but i just said you know what i'm just gonna i i'm just gonna go somewhere i don't know where i'm gonna go i'm just gonna go somewhere it was like a thursday afternoon or something like that and i I was just bored so i started driving around aimlessly and i came across a strip club and i'm like you know what i've never really gone to a strip club before whatever i'll go in here and i uh experienced the magic of a strip club on the weekdays because it was very yeah. much like Orgy of the Dead. Like, they, they don't have their A game on, you know? Yeah, it's kind of sad and pathetic. And the guys there kind of, yeah, like really depressing. And I, and I said to myself, I'm going to sit here. Apparently it was happy hour. I'm going to sit here. I'm going to drink really crappy uh, cheap beer until yeah. I see a dance that moves me. <laughs> and so I got drunk for about an hour. And then suddenly they could... Now up to the stage. Please put your hands together for Candy. Candy. And she came out in a really cheap, like, elementary school looking full body space outfit. Oh, nice. Like a NASA space helmet, like a a whole space suit. And she's dancing to whatever that song was from the 80s that ripped off David Bowie's uh, Space Oddity. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Uh, it, yeah, it was the same song. It was it was yeah. still Major Tom. Like Major was, Tom's Coming Home, I think, is what it was called. Yeah. Dripping yeah. And she's stripping to that. Yeah. And I was like, you know what? I think we have a winner. And I gave her like $20 uh, and I left. I got the chorus. I got the chorus. Earth below us. Yeah. Moving faster. Yeah. Falling away. Yeah. Oh, God. Yeah. yeah. That, yeah. I liked it. So it was <laughs> obvious that, like, she was not allowed to do this on a Friday or Saturday night, but she really wanted to. And this was her time to shine. Yeah. Like it's... a Thursday at four o'clock in the afternoon. At, at, was her one chance to do the song she wanted. At some point, she had to have that conversation with the club owner who I'm casting as Ron Jeremy uh, yeah. and say, you don't understand. I'm an artist. Damn it. <laughs> it's like, okay, do it. At a, do it on a Thursday at three 30. Yeah. Oh, you're not gonna, you're, you're not gonna, reg- you're not gonna regret this. Yeah. This is going to be amazing. The, the only, the only other thing sadder than that is, Going into a Blarney Stone at the, like that same time of day. Really? Are Are you familiar with the Blarney Stone? I don't know if no, they were, I am not. Uh, in New York, they were a chain of Irish bars. Hmm. So these were some broken, ugly old people. You know, like yeah, like like the kinds of characters who were in Shaun of the Dead, but fucking worse. You know, much more broken, much more sad and lonely. And this is what I do. I Aww, drink. That's sad. <laughs> so after the cat dance is the slave dance. No, no. Let's stay a little on the cat dance just a little bit longer. You got to okay. admit some money was spent on that outfit. A pussycat is born yeah. to be whipped. Yeah, yeah. That's so, another good line from Criswell. So it was a full cat outfit, including ears. With, that she took off in pieces. With the tits cut out and the ass cut out. Yeah. Is how she started. And she was alley catting her way while the guy was whipping her. And she definitely had a problem with the legs because she, she's like, oh, crap, I'll have to sit down for this. OK, trying to take off these leg pieces having a hard time i guess i should be dancing here here's a kick here's a kick now let me get this damn leg off Mm -hmm. let me get this let me get this damn she was having some problems yeah it seemed near the end of the dance yeah but i I... did like the cat dance i really like the song it's a really cute little like do 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 you know nice and light upbeat it's an Mm -hmm. upbeat song i just kind of picture her now you know, just very leather faced. Yes. Smoking a Marlboro, scotch on the rocks, and just being like, yeah, these fucking kids today, they don't know anything about dancing. Today, I was in Orgy of the Dead, damn it. It's all about the fucking pole these days. Back in my day, it was a fucking art. I was a cat, and I was, I was really the a cat. cat. I did the cat dance. I, I I felt the cat spirit enter into me, and just take over my body. Anybody can spin on a pole. Thank you, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Unfortunately, <laughs> you're probably like right on the money with that. <laughs> After the cat dance is the slave dance. The slave the, dance, which I think I've completely blocked out of my memory. The girl's getting whipped, and that's where it comes. That's where Criswell does the torture, torture, it pleasures me. <laughs> there are some wonderful little, like, one off, very strange, bizarre lines throughout this whole movie. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like that. To love the cat. Is to be the cat. To be the cat. So the slave is getting whipped and then like breaks free and starts dancing. It's not the best, especially 
following the cat dance, mm -hmm. which is apparently, I would say, our, our number one right now. But after the slave dance comes <gasps> the Mexican dance. The Mexican dance. Which is how it is it, listed in the credits. Mexican dance. <laughs> and and of course, throughout the entire dance, they have to be talking about uh, bullfighters and Day of the Dead. Mm -hmm. El Dia de los Muertos. <laughs> and after that, more racism is the Hawaiian dance. Mm -hmm. And and she's. They mentioned that she worships snakes, smoke and flame. So I'm not exactly sure what type of Hawaii they had in mind. <laughs> but um, yeah, it was the 60s. The eighth dance is what is known as the skeleton dance. And that's the woman and she was a bride. So she has a skeleton that's there at the entrance to the grave. And she she kind of caresses it at the end, the beginning and the end of the dance. And she's got the veil and everything. And she just does this really weird, like, I'm going to twirl just my right boob. This is my thing. This is my trademark. Everyone knows me because I only twirl my right boob. And I'm going to do it over and over again for how much time do I have? 20 minutes? And they 20 were... minutes of twirling my ugly right boob. And they were barely big enough to twirl. Yeah, it's not like she has these big, huge boobs. And she she's has these tiny little things, but she's just like, nope, men love it when I twirl my right boob. And she's all hunched over when she does it, like like in House of Dracula. Yeah, she has to bend over like seriously to get the correct boob twirling. So if you want to know what the nurse from House of Dracula looks like if she was a stripper, watch this movie. And that's pretty bad to have to sit through that like boob twirl for like 10 or 15 minutes or however long these damn musical numbers are. It's it, difficult to tell how long these strip teases are uh -huh. because they feel a half hour long each. They're somewhere on the edge of eternity. Uh -huh. They really are. Yeah. It's um, difficult to mm -hmm. tell how long this movie is because these <laughs> all of these strip teases sound like feel like a freaking eternity. Yes. Mm -hmm. But it really is something that has to be seen to be believed. But the worst, I think, after the skeleton dance is the zombie dance. The zombie dance. Yeah. Yes. Dance number nine. Because it, she, apparently she's a zombie. I, I personally, I thought that they were all zombies, but, you know, they don't they don't really fully explain what these people are. Well, well. She's she's kind of like a Baskin Robin zombie, like a double scoop of zombies. Yeah, yeah, that's good thinking. Yeah. So they they say that she acted like a zombie in life, so she'll like remain a zombie in death. But she's doing a strip tease, acting like a zombie, so she's barely moving. And she's by, got her arms forward, all zombie like, and like, oh, here's my dance. I'm gonna lift my arm a little bit. Now I'm gonna lower it. This and is my dance. By acting like a zombie in real life, I like to imagine her saying, okay, honey, I'm going to go take a really cold shower. Get ready for the loving. <laughs> That's just me. <laughs> uh, hey, honey, how are you doing? Uh, you know, brains. <laughs> What do you want to do tonight, honey? Well, I thought I could come through the window and you could shoot me in the head. Would that be cool? <laughs> I was wondering if I could just eat your arm. Just a little nibble. Or just a taste. Eat. I mean, just a arm. taste. Yeah. It'll either it'll or. still it'll still work. You know, you might have a little scarring, but you know, that's a sign of our love. But the 10th dance, the 10th dance, that's the fluff dance. This one would have died for feathers, furs, and fluff. <laughs> now, wouldn't it have been much more amusing if it was fluff as in a fluff and nutter? The fluffer nutter dance. Yes. 
That that would be odd. That she that as she's dancing, she is just getting covered in marshmallow cream. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So when the tenth and final dance ends, consider, that's when consider it for the remake. Do you still got that guy's number? <laughs> no, I do not. No, I, he is probably dead. Let's he was play probably this shot bitch. in Mexico. <laughs> He is prob more more than likely dead. Yeah. So the last dance ends, and then finally Criswell's like, "Okay, bitch, you can have your pleasures." <laughs> he doesn't say that, yeah. but he finally offers Shirley to his uh to his assistant. So so Gulita does like a little lame dance, but it's getting then, too late. It's getting too late. Yeah, is there time? And Criswell says. In in a way that is very much breaking character, he just goes, "You better hope there is." <laughs> so it's like finally I get to like I don't know rape this woman or kill her. I'm not sure what's going on here, but uh, vampire diet vampira. I, I know what I'm hoping for. That's all I could say. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So she goes to claim Shirley. But then the sun happens, the sun comes up, and everybody is turned to bones, and the last scene, which is horrible... Well, wait a second, wait a second. They all turn to bones, and they destroy what would have been a brilliant lesbian scene. Yes. That's what I was looking so. for. <laughs> Damn so it. then Bob and Shirley wake up, and they're there at the, the scene of, the, of everything. And they're paramedics, badly written paramedics. What's this you say? Who is trying to kill you? The ghouls, they all turned into skeletons. <laughs> yes. She cut me here. Must have been injured in the crash. You know, you two were very lucky. Uh, and they weren't the s- dead the whole time. They were just asleep. It was the all same dream. a dream. All yeah, they were having the dream. same dream. Yeah. And Criswell shows up back in his coffin and does a it, it's a good it's a good speech he does at the end, but I think that there might be a few periods and commas that he misses. <laughs> he, he's he, because he he goes through these two or three sentences as one sentence uh-huh. near the end. He goes Yes, they were lucky, those two young people. May you be so lucky. But do not trust to luck at the full of the moon. When the moon is dark, made a wide open path over around the newly opened grave of the night people. Who can say that we do not exist? Can you? <laughs> it's like, whoa, That you just said that as one sentence. <laughs> but that was obviously three or four sentences you, mm-hmm. you said there. But do not trust to luck, period, Mr. Criswell. That is a period there. When the moon is dark, comma, little pause, uh, make a wide path around the grave of the night people, period. There's another period there. Uh-huh. Who can say that we do not exist, question mark? Can you? But he says <laughs> yeah. it all as one big thing. Like, this is one sentence. Uh-huh. Like, can we just get this done? <laughs> can we please just end this movie because yes. I need to be done with this. Roll credits, roll credits, roll credits for Christ's sakes. Right? <laughs> like I, like in the porno that I was going to do, like I was going to be Criswell, but then I was also going to be like the Wolfman of the Mummy so I could like get a blowjob or whatever uh-huh. and be in a porn but not be in the porn. And so my idea was we would Frankenstein the credits. So in the end credits, it says the Wolfman and the Mummy question mark as if to say who can say we did not get an actual wolfman and mummy for this part Mm -hmm. Hmm? Mm -hmm. that was my plan maybe they were who knows (laughs) but this movie really is something that like you, you, you really have to see to believe it It's it's a hard movie to sit through all the way it's a hard movie to watch. Yes, it is. It's, it really does have an Ed Wood flavor, but technically Ed Wood didn't direct this movie. Uh, Stephen Apostoloff did, and he's an amazing man. 
But this is not Ed Wood's movie. This was the start of Ed Wood's monster nudie film phrase from the Ed end credits of Tim Burton's movie, but but this is not an Ed Wood film. Mm-hmm. But I have to say, and this uh, this starts off the um, the homework for this movie. Sitting down and watching this movie is a difficult and painful experience. Listening to this movie is amazing. Uh I found it interesting. I found parts of it to be very good. Uh, Other parts, I just wasn't into the music as much. But, you know, you're more musical than I am anyway. Yes. The music was done by a man named Jaime Mendoza Nava. He's a composer from Bolivia. He studied in Juilliard, for Christ's sake. And he also did m- music for a bunch of other kind of like low budget movies. He did the music for Equinox. Yeah. And okay. the town that dreaded the town that dreaded sundown. Yeah. He also did the music for that and a bunch of other like a bajillion other movies. And and the soundtrack is amazing. It's really, really good. And it's actually available on CD. It was released in the late 1990s by a company called Strange Love Records. And the CD is really beautiful, and in the 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 liner notes, they have pictures of all the different women, and it's done really well. And it's still available. It's available on Amazon and at CD Universe for eleven ninety nine. Uh-huh. And I bought a copy of the soundtrack, and I would I would get a beer and a and the hottest bath you can think of, and lay in the bath. And just listen to the Orgy of the Dead soundtrack and drink my beer. And it was just the greatest, the, just the greatest experience. I would fall asleep. It got to the point where I could only fall asleep if I was listening to the Orgy of the Dead soundtrack. <laughs> okay. So like 98, 97, 98, 99, it was a regular thing for me to go to sleep listening to this movie. Is that <laughs> odd? Uh... It's not for me, you know. I I I kind of need quiet and I need dark to, uh, but I have problems sleeping anyway. Genie needs something on, so we might have to try Orgy of the Dead, but she'll need she'll put on the television to like go to bed. Oh well, you should try Orgy of the Dead because it really is the music really is amazing. Every once in a while, I would be uh, woken up to the sound of someone getting whipped. <laughs> well, don't we all? Yeah, or I'd be woken up to the sound of uh, that horrible howling, just, but it really, the music really is interesting. It really is an an incredible experience because the the film is bad to watch, but when you have to listen to the film, then the, the bizarre dialogue and the strange sound effects and the music and the writing really comes at you in a different way. You don't have to to watch the horrible, ugly looking strippers, and you don't have to to see the bizarre sets and poor old Criswell. You just get to listen to the film, and it's a completely different experience. And it's quite an enjoyable one. And I really do recommend it. Orgy of the Dead is a pretty bad movie, but it's a great soundtrack. Well, and it is available on YouTube, which is surprising. But it is available on YouTube. So if you ever, you know, you know, want something different, just pop it on. You don't have to listen to it. Just put it on your computer and go about your day. Have that on. And it's quite an amazing experience. Well, I cannot express enough how awesome it is. What threw me off is that one of the things that you said for this homework is just like leave it on, you know, and listen to it while you're doing something else. Well, when I'm doing something else, then I lose focus on that. So like it it could be playing and I'm not even like really hearing it anymore. I would hear bits and it's like that that bit's pretty okay. This bit sounds kind of stupid, you know? Yeah. So, you know, just listening to it, I mean, maybe if I was in a bathtub with a beer, that would be a little different, but just like listening to the movie itself, then I would start getting involved with other things. Yeah. That's a good point. And 
lose but it really is focus. awesome it really is awesome uh i can't everybody should see if you're a bad movie person then you owe it yourself owe it to yourself to see this movie at least once okay yes because it is one of those hallmark bad movies that you hear about and things like that. You need to sit down and watch it. And I still, you know, I think it's better than Manos, but not by much. I'm, I'm, I've got a, a copy of the book in front of me, Muddled Mind, the complete works of Edward D. Wood Jr. Yeah. And I, I, I'm, I'm, popped up the part about orgy of the dead and it says here although although the film is an hour and 15 minutes there is only 22 minutes of dialogue I the rest of the time is spent with, a little high <laughs> yeah the rest of the time is spent with bad strippers and pseudo supernatural dances being leered at by the infamous criswell mm-hmm. that's interesting the book itself isn't actually uh is a book of short stories. Really? And includes an introduction by Forrest Ackerman. Nice. I might have to pick one pick that one up. What's that called again? It's a difficult one to track down. What's it called again? Orgy of the Dead. It's a difficult one to find. No, the book. Oh, this book. Uh Muddled Mind, the complete works of Ed Wood. Yeah. No, but but the the book itself, as in Orgy of the Dead, includes an introduction by Forrest Ackerman. Oh, oh, I thought we were talking about the same book. Okay. No, apparently, apparently, um, Forrest Ackerman served as Ed Wood's um literary agent for a while, and didn't really particularly care from for him, for what I heard. Yeah, as far it says here that Forrest Ackerman. Proclaimed himself Ed Wood's illiterary agent. <laughs> that's that's awesome. <laughs> he was also the the assistant. Ed Wood was also the assistant director for Orgy of the Dead and was paid next to nothing. Uh. Uh. The name strippers that Stephen employed for the film, um, the the film generated it had a small following at drive-in theaters and adult movie houses. Surprise! Uh, yeah, <laughs> bizarre. It is something that everyone should see. I'm a big I'm a big believer of it. I uh, and I do kind of wonder what else was out at the same time in the way of an adult movie. Yeah. Because, you know, like, strippers, we don't care about strippers anymore. We got an internet full of porn, you know? Yeah. We could watch people fuck at any moment, you know? But back then, that would have been a really fucking hot movie, I think. Really? I, I think so. The preview is really it's amazing. Really smack to they- it. The preview is awesome because the preview has this horrible the the first line of the preview is just this deep voiced man saying, are you heterosexual? (laughs) Which apparently what they're trying to say is, um, if you're straight, you'll love this movie, (laughs) I guess. Yeah. Not exactly sure what they're trying to say there. Unless they were just curious. Because <laughs> there, are, there are times where I'll like go downtown and stand on the corner and ask people that just all day. Are you heterosexual? And then just watch their reactions. <laughs> their reaction is probably fiends! Fiends! <laughs> probably the reaction that mm-hmm. you get, I would imagine. Fiends! I love that. I'm going <laughs> to make that as a I'm going to put that on my phone. So, what is there anything else to really be said about Orgy of the Dead? Do you have any no. parting? No. Yeah. Not at all. Not at all. Okay. So, it's something you really have to watch. 
have you? It's, fun. it's a fun movie. It is a fun movie if you just get some friends together and just some beers and you just you put that on and you just rip on it because it's just it's waiting to be ripped on. Yeah, it's a fun movie to watch with your friends and to see if you can survive it because it, it really <laughs> is a bit of a painful one to watch. But I will say the music is amazing and it's there's just something really weird about it that just if if you if you love bad movies, you have to watch this movie at least once. You do. It, it should be, you know, just like Manos. Manos is on the required watching list. Yeah. You know, you don't have to like it, but you it, you know, if you're going to consider yourself a bad movie fan, you have you have to watch it. You have to watch it. Yeah. Or I will get a cop to shoot your face. Nice. What are you thinking about for next week? Have you come to any kind of a decision or conclusion? Cause, no, cause no, I'm not sure. That was kind of a tough choice that you put out there. Hey, I've got a bunch of things that I that I that I would like to do, like maybe shockwaves, because I, you know, Nazi zombies. I mean, I've well, never seen just, that movie. Let's just. And then I thought maybe there. the Rocketeer. I thought maybe the Fifth Element, because you know, I've never seen that. Let's just put it out there, okay? So the two choices were, the two choices that you put in front of me were, um, yeah, uh, Shockwaves and The Rocketeer, okay? So Nazi zombies or Disney film? I thought The Rocketeer because I think my kids will really like that. If we were live tweeting, we could put this up for a listener vote. Yeah, <laughs> you know, but as it is, yeah. by the time this show goes up, we'll probably be close to recording that one. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, you know, but we could put a poll on our page. If you come to our page at Facebook, we could put little polls up there and you could. Yeah, we should way. do that. But but man, that's a tough choice. They, they, they're both good in their own completely different ways. And yeah, yeah, I do think your kids would like Shockwave. Uh, not Shockwave. <laughs> not Shockwave. I'm not showing them that. The Rocketeer. The Rocketeer is a fun little flick. Yeah. Shockwave has Shockwaves have Peter Cushing. Nice. Yeah. I, have you not seen it before? You've seen it? No, never seen it. You've never seen it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. This was always a favorite of a big favorite of mine because... Back in back in my day, you know, uh, before cars or the internet or anything like that, um, the only real zombie movies we had were Night of the Living Dead, Children Shouldn't Play with Dead Things, and Shockwaves. Yeah, you know, so that was that was the first holy trinity of zombie movies, <laughs> as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, I've always I I. I found the entire movie on youtube and i thought well you know i've I've always wanted to see that and maybe yeah. this might be time but i'm really i really like that last captain america movie that marvel did I, I, the first one no the first one captain america the first avenger and i realized recently that the person who made that movie also did the rocketeer and it really does feel like those two movies are in the same universe because a lot it of does. captain america is like back in the 1940s and that just really that's so much of the rocketeer right there you know and the effect in that was fucking awesome yeah the, yeah the effect the, yeah the, the little scrawny captain america yeah i was like holy fuck that's amazing but it really How does they do that really does feel like these two movies are somehow related yeah. that first captain america movie and then the rocketeer you know and and i actually did find how they did it by the way <laughs> yeah they they just plastered his face on a little guy who was doing the body acting no they right? they put a 3d on the footage they put a 3d mesh over over oh. him, over him oh. and then they would just pull in the little dots where they where they felt they needed to be oh well that's awesome which is some maddening work 
Yeah. That is some maddening kind of work. Huh. But, yeah. That's how they made the little skinny Steve Rogers. Yeah, and the Rocketeer was a was based on a comic book too. So it, him doing Captain America is really him coming back, you know. Yeah, and they were going to make a bunch of Rocketeer movies, but it bombed in the box office, and that's a yeah. shame because it and it shouldn't they, have because it was definitely yeah. a better movie than that. Yeah, it's a it's a great movie, and these two movies are very much related. I fell in love with Jennifer Connelly in that movie. Yeah. She was amazing in that movie. I fell in love with her with Phenomenon, the Dario Argento movie. Yeah. Yeah. I think um, I've had that on my I think I had that on my blog. We might have to flip a coin on this one. Yeah. Cuz again, Peter Cushing. Well um, then, let's do that. Let's do the. <laughs> let's do. Uh, let's do Shockwaves because I've never seen it. I really want to see it. Yeah, yeah. Because really, this should be on your must-watch list. It totally yeah. should. As as a horror fan, not so much as a bad movie fan. Yeah, but as a horror fan, uh, first Nazi zombies. Everybody's doing Nazi zombies now. You know, there are a few few Nazi zombie movies out there. Yeah. Offhand, right the second, I can only think of Dead Snow. But that was what are, I was thinking of. Yeah. There are a few others. I, I don't just don't offhand recall what they are. So, yeah, yeah okay. no, there's a couple. Let's do Shockwaves. I have potential homework. Potential homework. Okay. Yeah. I, I would really like everybody to watch this one. It's potential because I have, you know, as we've been doing the show, I've been kind of cruising YouTube to see if I could find it. I haven't found it yet, but I know for a fact it's out there. Uh, and okay. when I find it, I'll post a link on the page. Uh, okay. Have you ever heard of Kenneth Anger? Mm, the name vaguely rings a bell, but no. Kenneth Anger. Well, in particular, the short I want you to find and watch is called Fireworks by Kenneth Anger. Okay. Kenneth Anger would be Ed, Ed Wood's older, artier brother. Okay. Uh, and he made a series of, well, throughout his life, he made a series of short films usually very homoerotic in nature and fireworks is for the symbolism that he's using to bring that out is really some amazing stuff to watch so i kind of think of it as a more well artsy glenn or glenda kind of you know yeah because that's what that's sort of what edward was trying to do in glenn and glenn or glenda you know, and for the you know for for Ed Wood, I think Glenn or Glenda is a really great movie. If we take out the insert bits, yeah, you know, um, and really, I can't. Well, okay, Kenneth Anger, Kenneth Anger was pretty much in the um, kind of whole Andy Warhol scene before Andy Warhol showed up. You know, so like the yeah. world that Andy Warhol wound up taking over and ruling for a while was pretty much Kenneth Anger's first. And there was hatred between the two of them, where I had I had read somewhere that Kenneth Anger would sneak in, sneak to Andy Warhol's house in the middle of the night and throw like different colored buckets of paint on it. <laughs> You know, stuff like this. Okay, I found it. You found it? Okay. Yes. Good. I am uh, Facebook messaging you the link as we speak. Excellent. But yeah. Excellent. Thank it's you, like, sir. It's, it's like it's like 15 minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I found it. Yeah, I, it's I'm, a restored version by like a. It's a restored version by UCLA. Oh, nice, nice. That should be good. 
Okay, that's it. I, I really want to hear people's opinions of this movie, and and what they th- what they think about it. And I I, I got a bit to say. <laughs> Sweet. All right. I'm. That's homework I can get behind. Okay. Cool. Cool. Well, yeah, you know the the theater geek and you would certainly like appreciate it. I'm sure. Yeah. You know. Because again, it's it's a very very artistic. It's silent. Well, it's not silent. It, it's it doesn't have dialogue. So everything you get out of it, you have to get out of it through the subtext and the symbolism of it. Yeah, I'm. I'm excited. This should be good. Cool, cool. Well, I do need to start wrapping this up because I've already got the text from Jeannie. She's on her way home. And, you know, whenever she gets home, I like to spend time with her because we get so fucking little of it, you know? Um, So, parting thoughts. Um, Parting thoughts. Um, At the... When the moon is dark... Be sure to make a a wide path around the newly opened grave of the night people. Yes. Those are those are words that should have been taught to us in school. So fuck our school system. Right? You know, I mean why didn't they teach us the important stuff like that? Cuz I can't tell you yeah. how many times I've fallen into graves. Because they're fiends. Fiends. <laughs> Yes, yes. And you can, there are a lot of ways for you to contact us. You can email us at Pope on Film. Uh, sorry, no, just Pope at UndeadCow.com. Uh, you can find us in the iTunes store. Uh, best way for that is to just search Undead Cow, all one word, and it brings up all the Undead Cow shows, including the Pope on Film. Uh, you can search our page, Pope on Film, on Facebook. And you can watch this as a video episode on YouTube at users forward slash Undead Cow Films. And Stitcher. Damn it. Yeah, this Stitcher. It's some Stitcher kind of website. Like a, Stitcher is like a, a, a radio station just for podcasts. So you can listen to us on Stitcher, apparently. It was it was something like oh you got to be on Stitcher if you're gonna do a podcast you got to be on Stitcher. Well we're we're there. Yeah, yeah. So you can listen to us there. Yay, yay Stitcher! <laughs> I'm a big fan of st- stitching things. Stitching things. <laughs> so until next week, this is Bunny Williams. And this is Reverend Steve saying thanks for listening, America and other countries. And we'll see you next week. (laughs) We'll see you next week, you godless heathens. Cut and print. We should awesome podcast.